Christian, your salvation is an absolutely 100% free gift from God to you. You cannot earn it. You cannot in any way attain to it. You can't do anything to make yourself worthy of it. It is purely 100% a gift from God to you. We have fallen way too far short for any way to feel like somehow we're going to merit this incredible eternal salvation. He makes that so clear to us in Ephesians chapter 2, verses 8 and 9, when he says, For grace you have been saved through faith, and that not of yourselves. It's the gift of God, not as a result of works, that no one may boast. <laughs> you know what grace is? It's getting what you don't deserve. I don't deserve that. And he gives it to you. That's salvation through Jesus Christ. It's amazingly simple. If there was anything more involved, if there was anything uh, more difficult than that, anything more to it, we would all fail miserably, every one of us. You know, uh, we're told in Romans chapter 3, verse 10, there is none righteous. None. And some of you went, oh, come on, come on. There's got to be some out there. He adds, I'm going to finish the verse. No, not one. Not one. So, brethren, what an amazing salvation we have been gifted with. And so what do you do with that? The only thing you can do with it, with any gift, is just receive it. Humbly just receive it. You know, he says in John chapter 1, verse 12, he says, but as many as received him, that would be Jesus, to them gave he the the right to become the children of God, even to those who believe in his name. What an amazing salvation. Gift from God to us. Wow. That's why I'm here. But you know, Jesus himself has also got a special gift for us. Listen to what Jesus told his disciples in John chapter 14, verse 16 and 17. It was the night he was going to be betrayed, the night before he was crucified. He was with his disciples in the upper room, and he said, I will ask the Father, and he will give you another helper that he may be with you forever. That is the spirit of truth. That would be the Holy Spirit, whom the world cannot receive because it does not see him or know him. But you know him because he abides with you and will be in you. Later that night, he added these words in chapter 16, verse 7. I tell you the truth, it's to your advantage that I go away. For if I do not go away, the helper will not come to you. But if I go, I will send him to you. You know what that special gift from Jesus is to all who believe? It's the Holy Spirit. <clears throat> That's what I want to talk about this morning. The indwelling abiding presence of the Holy Spirit in every believer. Christ's gift to us, gift to us who believe and have received him personally as Lord and Savior. You know, there are two aspects to the presence of the Holy Spirit in you. One aspect is that initial, it's kind of unobservable, uh, generally no feelings attached, work of the Holy Spirit the moment you receive Christ as Lord, the moment you're born again. The Holy Spirit very quietly, succinctly, and truly comes into your life. And Scripture says he regenerates your spirit. Your spirit was dead. He made it alive. That's the new birth, isn't it? It's being born again. 
he says, then the Holy Spirit indwells you. He's there. He's there. And then he says also that he seals you unto the Lord, unto God. That means that God's got his seal on you. You belong to him now, and you're going to heaven. He's accomplished, settled forever. The gift of the Holy Spirit. Wow. But you know, the second aspect of his work is the potential work of the Holy Spirit on a believer after he's been born again. This is definitely more observable. This is more experiential in the life of a believer. Scripturally speaking, there's something the Holy Spirit wants to do once he's in there. Something that he definitely can do and, and something he desires to do in every single believer. That brings us to Ephesians chapter 5. <clears throat> in this context, we're realizing what this ungodly world is like in which we live. And with that in mind, picking it up at verse 15, he says this, Therefore, be careful how you walk, not as unwise men, but as wise, making the most of your time because the days are evil. <laughs> so then, do not be foolish, but understand what the will of the Lord is. And here he goes. Do not be drunk with wine, which is dissipation, but here it is. Be filled with the Spirit. <sighs> you know, once the Holy Spirit is in your life, <clears throat> he is there that he might fill the believer, that he might fill you. What does that mean? That means he's in a place now where he's going to take control. He's going to be in charge. The question for every single believer is this. Since you have the Holy Spirit. The question becomes, does the Holy Spirit have you? Who's really in charge there? Is it your flesh or is it the Spirit of God? You know? When he says, that he, that gives this command to the believers regarding the Holy Spirit, be filled with the Spirit. He's saying, let the Spirit have that place of authority and control in your life. He's there for that purpose. Let him fill your life. When he's in that place where he has filled you, there are in Scripture four unique works of the Spirit that will take place in the life of that believer. And that's what I want to point out to you. This is what will happen. This is what the Holy Spirit will do when he's filled you, when he's in that place of authority and control in your life which you have given to him. Four things. Number one is this. He empowers you. He empowers you. Acts 1.8, you will receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you. And you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem and all Judea and Samaria and even to the remotest parts of the earth, wherever you go, even in Wilton, Connecticut, circa 2024. <clears throat> that word, you will receive power, the word there is, is dunamis in the Greek. It's the word we get our word dynamic or dynamite from. And it's always a reference to the power of God. The miracle working power of God. The point is, I can't do anything in and of myself that's really effective for God. I'm bankrupt as far as that goes. I just can't. Jesus made that clear to his disciples that same night in John 15, verse 5, when he said, I'm the vine, you're the branches. He who abides in me and I in him bears much fruit. And here's the clincher, for apart from me, you can do maybe a little bit. No, zero, nothing. You can't do anything apart 
Jesus said, from me. You know what he's saying there? When it comes to this life, this spiritual life, this, this walk with the Lord, this, this effectiveness for the Lord, we need help. We can't do it ourselves. Let me get real about it. We need supernatural help. And the point is when he says, he, the Spirit, will empower you. Basically what he's saying, it's purely a matter of the Holy Spirit doing the work because you can't. And lo and behold, he'll do it through you. That's amazing. You know, uh, I heard the story about a fellow named Robert Moffat. Back in the 1800s, he was one of the very early missionaries from England to Africa, when Africa was a dark continent. And he wanted to go there and share with the, the native people of Africa, Jesus. And he was there for 20, 25 years or so. I don't know, you know. He finally came, old age came back to England. And he was such a need in Africa. He went around churches in England telling them about the great need in Africa for the gospel. He was at one church one time and he said these words. He said, any particular morning I can get up and I can look out there and I can see the, the smoke from a thousand villages that have never once heard the name of Jesus Christ. There was a young man that heard him say that, and it fired his heart. His name was David Livingston. Maybe some of you have heard that name. One of the favorite sons of England. He's now buried in Westminster Abbey with the kings and the queens of England. He went to Africa with the gospel of Jesus Christ and gave his life serving in Africa. But here's my point. Robert Moffat said those words, but the Holy Spirit took them and shot him into the heart of David Livingston. That's God. That's God. I can sit here and flap my gums worthlessly. That's why I pray beforehand, oh Lord, you minister. I remember in my church in Truckee, California, there was <laughs> a lady in our church, and her father actually was from the East Coast, lived in New York. And uh, he was a barber in the city. He was also a bookie when it was illegal to be a bookie. And he actually rubbed shoulders with mafia, even celebrities. He was this little five foot five, skinny as a rail guy. And in his old age, his daughter said, Dad, I want you to come and live with us. And she brought him to Truckee. He was probably 70 somewhere, you know, like that. His name was Ronnie. And she, she said, we're going to church, Dad. And so the first service, Ronnie came. And I met Ronnie, little old Ronnie, this, this guy. He sounded like he was from Brooklyn. And, and uh, you know, he was, he, he was a work of art, I'm telling you. And I looked him in the eye, and I said, Ronnie, Jesus loves you. Ronnie's eyes got as big as saucers. What? He does? Yes, Ronnie, Jesus loves you. I didn't know that. I found out later that little guy got born again right then and there. He got on fire for Jesus. A few days later, I baptized him in Donner Lake, this little old guy. And he was at church every Sunday, midweek, any time after that. And he would always remind me, Pastor, Pastor, when you said Jesus loves me, Whoa, you know? Now, wait a minute. I can say those words. I don't know how many people I've said that to. You know, Jesus loves you. Yeah, 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 it's cool. <laughs> but I said, on that occasion to Ronnie, wham! God did, that, 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 that's the Lord. That's, that's, that's the empowering of the Spirit, brother, brethren. And that's, that's what he does. It's a matter of Christian, be filled with the Spirit and then be available and see what the Holy Spirit might want to do. 
Leave it with the Holy Spirit. It's not your job. It's not your work. See what the Holy Spirit's going to do. I think it's exciting to pray and and then say, okay, Lord, here we go and see what God might want to do. You know? Power for service. Usefulness, really, to the Lord. Power, spiritual power in your witness is the work of the Holy Spirit. It's not you. I bet many of you have had those occasions where something happened and you said, that was God, (laughs) that wasn't me. (laughs) That was God, amen. So you know what the Lord says, Christian? Be filled with the Spirit. When that happens, you get empowered by the Spirit. Here's the second thing. You will be led by the Spirit. The Spirit will lead the believer. Romans 8.14, for all who are being led by the Spirit of God, these are the sons of God. Galatians 5.18, if you are led by the Spirit, you are not under the law. (laughs) Holy Spirit's in control, you don't have to worry about the law. Isaiah, I love Isaiah 48, 17. Thus says the Lord, your Redeemer, the Holy One of Israel, I am the Lord your God who teaches you to profit and who leads you in the way you should go. The leading of the Holy Spirit. And he really kind of leads in two ways. One way is uh, he, he, he leads us in the way that we should order our lives, the, the way we, we, we should walk in this life. <clears throat> Psalm 143.10, teach me to do your will, for you are my God. Let your good spirit lead me on level ground. Galatians 5.16, but I say, walk by the spirit, and you will not carry out the desire of the flesh. So he kind of leads you. He leads you in that way, away from sin and in, 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 in the way that, of righteousness, the way that's right. Now, let me tell you, say this. This does not mean, oh, brother, I was afraid of that. No more, no more fun. Now I've got to be good. It's not that way at all. Not that way at all. It's a whole new perspective on life right from your heart. And you know what comes out? I... Why did it take me so long? Lord, this is life. So, brethren, that's 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 the that's the Lord. The second way is He literally guides our steps. You know, He says in Acts 13, 4. This is you know, Paul on his first missionary journey. So being sent out by the Holy Spirit, we went down to Seleucia, and from there we sailed to Cyprus. They were being led by the Spirit of God. In Acts 16, 6, Paul's second missionary journey, they passed through Phrygian and Galatian region, having been forbidden by the Holy Spirit to speak the word in Asia, the province of Asia. Basically, God was saying to them, not here, not now, I've got another place for you. He was, le- he was taking them to Europe. So that was by the leading of the Holy Spirit. I love Psalm 37, 23. The steps of a man are established by the Lord, and he delights in his way. You know, it's a wonderful thing when you can be assured that you're being led and guided by the Holy Spirit in your life. And that's a result of being filled with the Spirit. That's what he does. He leads the believer. You know, uh, years and years ago, I pastored my very first church in Southern California. I was 27 years old when I got my first church to pastor, a little old church down in South Central Los Angeles. And I went up there, and it was just a little church, you know, just maybe 50 people or so. And I got up on the platform of that church, and I sat there. That's what you did back in those days. I was waiting to preach my very first sermon as a pastor. And I got this impression two years. And I thought, oh, that's interesting. 
Is the Lord saying, I'm going to be here for two years? I sort of tucked that away. And I went and I preached my first sermon and I got involved in the ministry of that little church. And I, I, I love that little church. It was mostly old folks. In fact, I had just been a youth pastor and here I was this young guy pastoring all these old folks. I called them my youth group with wrinkles. <laughs> they loved it. Anyway, I was pastoring that and it was coming up to two years. I never kind of forgot that, but I didn't. You know, I, I just let it be. I said, Lord, just lead me. And as I was serving there and coming up to two years, I was thinking, ah, oh, no, there's so much work to be done here. That must have been my imagination. But wouldn't you know, lo and behold, I get a call from a little church in Truckee, California. I had to look on a map to see where that was. Would you consider coming to be our pastor? So I went up into the High Sierra Mountains. It was near Lake Tahoe, beautiful place. And so I, uh, I said, Lord, I'll just go check it out, but I don't think so. Well, we went there, and I saw, Lord, there's a ministry here. I asked him, blind me to the mountains, because I love the mountains. Blind me to the mountains. I just want to see if you want me here. And uh, as, I, as we were driving back over the summit, back down to Southern California, I told Joyce, I said, I think God's going to call us to Truckee. And the interesting thing was I waited a month or so, and finally I got a call from the district superintendent. I was Christian and Missionary Alliance at the time. And uh, <clears throat> he said, Brian, the church in Truckee has called you to be their pastor. Well, I had felt like, and that was on a Sunday night, you know, and I, I had felt like he had prayed about it, and I just felt like that's what the Lord wanted to do. So I, I said, well, I accept. He would not accept it. He said, no, I want you to take a couple days and I just want you to pray about it. Well, I already had, but he would not accept okay. So, all right. A couple days later, he calls me up and I said, now I accept it. And he said, great. It wasn't until after all that happened that I looked at the calendar and realized the Sunday that he called me was the Sunday to exactly two years that I had sat at the pulpit, but he didn't accept it then. When he did accept it was literally the day of the month that I had received that two years from the Lord. You know, it's, it's exciting when the Lord leads. I mean, people ask me after that, you know, when I was leaving, Brian, how long are you going to be in Truckee? And I said, I don't have any idea. And I, I was thinking, hmm, maybe five years or so. I don't know. Well, 44 years later, there I was. <laughs> but, you know, it's just, it, it's just neat to see the way he leads and he does that. The Holy Spirit leads. He says, I'll lead your steps. I remember one time there was this young guy. He was not long out of high school, just a single guy. And he had been out of the drug culture. I mean, you know, he had been a real druggie, but he got saved. And he was so excited about his faith in Christ. It's so neat when you see somebody that's just come out of the darkness. He's on fire for the Lord. It's just so Enlivening, you know, you just love it. And here, this guy, he was just so excited about being a believer. And he, he was going to be at church every time we were there. He was there. And, uh, and one Sunday, um, uh, I found out that the day before on Saturday, his mother was in a car wreck. And she was okay, but the car was incapacitated. And he would always take his mother's car to come to church. And he wasn't going to be able to get to church. He wanted to be at church so much that he got up early and he walked, and I think it was a few miles, to come to church. On his way, he happened to run into one of his old druggy buddies. And they said, hey, man, what are you doing? I'm on my way to church. What? <laughs> church? Why are you going to church? And it just poured out of him what the Lord had done in his heart, his life. This guy listened to it. And when he got finished, he looked at him and said, can I go too? And he brought him to church. <laughs> he had to introduce me to him after the service, you know. It's just, you know what we call that? We call that a divine appointment, don't we? When you think something comes along and says, oh, why did this have to happen? Shoot. And then God does something. 
you know? He says, when you're filled with the Spirit, God leads literally your steps. Joyce's, my wife's favorite life verse is Proverbs 3, 5, and 6. Trust in the Lord with all your heart and don't lean on your own understanding. In all your ways, acknowledge him and he will make your paths straight. She learned it in the King James and he will direct your paths. And you know what, Christian, listen to me. That's our confidence. That's our confidence in Christ. You know, with the Holy Spirit there in charge. Here's the third thing. She's got, he empowers the believer. He leads the believer. He, pr- he produces the fruit of the Spirit in the believer. Listen to this. This is, this is the kind of fruit he wants to produce in your life. Galatians 5, 22 and 23. But the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. Against such things there's no law. Wow. I don't know about you, but I can dig that. That is really, that's awesome. And that's the fruit of the Spirit. That's not the fruit of my flesh. That's not the works of my flesh. That's the fruit of the Spirit of God. And that's what he does. When he gets control, when he gets that influence in your life, he, that's the work, that's the kind of fruit he produces in your life. Go figure. You know, I remember when God called me into the ministry way back, my first ministry was as a youth pastor in a church, and uh, I was excited to serve the Lord. I was so excited. I was going to seminary at the time, and I was a youth pastor at this church, and, and there was a fellow in the church. His name was Elvin, and I couldn't stand Elvin. <laughs> Elvin was like your fingernail on a chalkboard, if you know what I mean. It was like, oh, oh, Elvin. I mean, I just, I cringed around Elvin. I just could not stand that guy. He just, he he was just obnoxious to me. I felt really bad about that. Here I am, a servant of the Lord. I, you know, I want to be, I want to be a representative of the gospel of Jesus Christ, and I can't stand Elvin. (laughs) This is not good. So I prayed. Oh, I prayed. Dear Lord. I can't stand Elvin. (laughs) Now, Lord, I know you love Elvin. I know you love him. So you go ahead and love him. (laughs) But here's my request. Here's my request. Love him, Lord, through me. Love him through me. You love him through me. I have no explanation for what happened. A psychologist could probably break this down and, take, and figure it all out psychologically, but I am here to tell you there was a supernatural work of the Holy Spirit that took place in my life, and suddenly I had a whole different heart, and Elvin became a very good friend of mine. The rest of my ministry there, Elvin and I were tight. To me, supernatural power of the Holy Spirit did a work I couldn't do. So, the fruit of the Spirit, oh, that fruit, love, joy, peace, and all that good stuff. The fruit of the Spirit in the life of a believer is a powerful witness in this world. Powerful witness. That's the third thing. Here's the fourth thing. This is all right from the word. This is what the Holy Spirit will do when he gets in there and he gets control. And I'm here to tell you. The fourth thing is he will administer the gifts of the Holy Spirit through the believer. Administer the gifts of the Holy Spirit. 1 Corinthians chapter 12, verse 1. Now concerning spiritual gifts, brethren, I don't want you to be unaware And then picking it up in verse 7 through 11, but to each one is given the manifestation of the Spirit for the common good. 
For to one is given a word of wisdom through the Spirit. To another, the word of knowledge according to the same Spirit. To another, faith by the same Spirit. To another, gifts of healing by the one Spirit. To another, the effecting of miracles. To another, prophecy. To another, distinguishing of spirits. To another, various kinds of tongues. To another, the interpretation of tongues. Here's the point. But one and the same Spirit works all these things, distributing to each one individually just as he wills. The work of the Holy Spirit manifesting and administering the gifts of the Holy Spirit in believers, and it's for all of us. No one is left out of that. We're not talking about natural abilities here. We all have natural abilities. No, this is is something different. This is something much deeper. These are spiritual gifts. Now hear me, I believe God can take a natural ability and put an anointing of the Spirit on it and it becomes a manifestation of the Spirit, a spiritual gift. But this is something that's under the authority and control of the Holy Spirit. You don't decide that. The Holy Spirit decides that for you. But you've all been gifted and it's always for service unto the Lord. It's always to minister spiritual life to others. And we've all been gifted. I love the admonition that Peter gives us in 1 Peter chapter 4 regarding that. He says, as each one has received a special gift, as each one has received a special gift of the Spirit. Employ it in serving one another as good stewards of the manifold grace of God. And these gifts are so varied, so different. They're, they're unique in each one of us, you know? Whoever speaks, there's two areas that the Holy Spirit works his gifts. Some is, is in speaking, you know? Whoever speaks is to do so as one who is speaking the utterances of God. Whoever serves, this is somebody working with their hands and their feet, is to do so as one who is serving by the strength which God supplies. And here's the point, so that in all things God may be glorified through Jesus Christ, to whom belongs the glory and dominion forever and ever, amen. You know what he's saying there? Gifts of the Holy Spirit. You can't pat yourself on the back and look what gift I have. Look what the Holy Spirit has chosen to do and all the glory goes to him. People have, on occasion, you know, I've been a pastor for years. And, you know, people have come up. I mean, you know, I've, you know, I, I, there's always been those times when after church people go and have lunch together and they have roasted pastor for lunch. Those happen, you know. <laughs> but there's also been the times when somebody's come up and said, man, man, Pastor, you spoke right to my heart. You spoke to me. Oh, Lord, thank you. Thank you so much. I want you to know I can't take credit for that in any way, shape, or form. That would be like like somebody going to the doctor's office after a successful surgery and grabbing his tools, getting a a, a, a scalpel out and saying, oh, thank you, scalpel. Oh, thank you. The doctor's going, what are you doing? No. It's the work of the Lord. You know, it, it's the Lord. You thank the Lord. That's a work of the Holy Spirit going on. And you know what the Holy Spirit wants to do? He wants to make us all servants of his in the power of his spirit. In our own way. With our own gifts. In our own calling. Whatever that is. So, that, it, that is what constitutes our unique little part and ministry in the work of God that's going on in this world. That's our little place that we can shine for Jesus, whatever that is. So how? How how does that happen? It begins, it begins with be filled with the Spirit. And the Holy Spirit will take it from there. He'll take it from there. 
Okay, so, so then, getting near the end of this, how do you get filled with the Holy Spirit? <laughs> how do you do that? Brethren, the verb there in the Greek is a passive verb. That means you don't do it. The Holy Spirit does it. It's like saying, let him fill you. He wants to fill you. Let him fill you. Let him do it. That can happen in so many different ways. It can happen anytime. It's just where your heart's at. But I'll tell you, I, I want to leave you with, with, with one way or the other, kind of what's involved in that happening in your life. If you want to sit there and say, what do I need to do here? Well, I got five little points I'm going to wrap this up with, okay? Number one, number one is this. It, 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 it needs a true desire, a true desire. I love what Jesus said in, in uh, uh, the Beatitudes uh, when he said, blessed are uh, those who hunger and thirst for righteousness. Oh, they want it. They shall be filled. They shall be filled. It's that desire. If you're sitting there and going, oh, yeah, Pastor Brian, you know, that's really cool, and maybe, maybe I should do that someday, it's not going to happen. <laughs> you, know, if, 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 you know, if you're going, you're like, okay, maybe, you know, okay, Lord, you know, I guess. I've got so much on my plate, I don't know about this, but... You know what your prayer may need to be? Lord, I want to want to be filled with your spirit. Maybe that's where it's got to start for some of you. He hears it. But it's said, it, it, it's got to be a desire that you've got to want it. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for it. They'll be satisfied. Secondly, you know, one way or another, it involves repentance. You know, Peter said this in Acts chapter 2, verse 38, to the people who said, what do we need to do? Repent, and each one of you be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of your sins, and you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. You know, that's, repentance is simple, a word that just means it's an about faith. You've been indulging in worldliness. Maybe, the, maybe those, uh, you know, those, the, those old sinful ways and you turn away from that and you turn to Jesus. No more of that. Jesus, I want you and what you have for me. That's repentance. But you know something? <laughs> We're also imperfect, aren't we? I love what John tells us in 1 John verse 8 and 9 when he says, if we say that we have no sin, and this is to the Christian, this is the one that says, Lord, fill me with your Holy Spirit. I want to walk with you. And we discover something, you know. <clears throat> what? <laughs> I'm crashing a lot. I'm stumbling a lot. If we say that we have no sin, we're deceiving ourselves, and the truth is not in us. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and righteous to forgive us our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Wow. That's, you know, we stumble. And we, we turn to him, and, and, and we just confess it. And what does the Lord say? He's faithful means every time. He's righteous because of the cross. You're forgiven. And not only that, I'm going to clean the slate. We're going to get a fresh, fresh start here. You know, that confession is, uh, it's renewing and, and it's refreshing. It's, okay, Lord, let's go. Some of, some of us, 
uh, uh, may need a moment, a moment by moment, just sort of, you know, Lord, I need your help. And there will never be a time, I don't care what your situation is, there will never be a time when the Lord goes, okay, that's too much. You just stepped over the line. I have forgiven you so much. Now, I'm done. He'll never say that. Jesus said, when it comes to forgiveness, what did he say? 70 times, seven times. Every time. There's no reason why anyone here, anyone, regardless of where you've been even today, can't bow your head, turn it over to him and be filled with his spirit because forgiveness is in his wings all the time. <clears throat> you know, the beauty of it is the, there is spiritual help there for you. I love... I love what he says in Hebrews <clears throat> chapter 4, verse 15 and 16. For we do not have a high priest. He's referring to Jesus who cannot sympathize with our weaknesses. He's, I understand. But one who has been tempted in all things as we are, yet without sin, therefore let us draw near with confidence to the throne of grace. There it is so that we may receive mercy, that's not getting what you deserve, and find grace to help in time of need. The Lord is saying, I've forgiven you, I've saved you, and I'm there to help, forgive and help. So he's always saying, you know, the, the throne is wide open to you. Come to him. And so there's that desire and then there's that repentant heart before him. That's important. And here's the third thing. It's going to involve a total surrender. Jesus said, if anyone would come after me, let him deny himself. Take up his cross daily and follow me. I like what he says in Romans chapter 12, verse 1, I beseech you, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies a living and holy sacrifice, acceptable to God, which is your spiritual service of worship. Just surrender it all to him. It's not anymore a matter of what I'm trying to get out of God. It's totally now your will be done. I'm surrendering it all, Lord. Your will be done. I'm ready and willing for whatever that is, whatever your will is. Let's go. You know what Romans chapter 12 says about that? Because a lot of people sort of go, ah, I, 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 don't, I don't know if I want to do that. You know what he says about his will for your life? Romans chapter 12 verse 2. It's good. It's acceptable. And it's perfect. Let me put it this way. It's good means, hey, this is, this is right on. This is good. Acceptable means it's well-pleasing. You know, it's not some sort of miserable medication. Hey, I like this. It's acceptable. This is cool and perfect. You know what he means by that? God looks at you and he knows you. <laughs> he knows you better than you know yourself. You know that. This is perfect for you. My will is perfect for you. And so you surrender it all and say, your will be done, Lord. I'm ready. Let's go. Whatever that is, that's what I want. And then maybe number four, maybe at this point just simply ask him to fill you with his spirit. Ask him. I like what, what Jesus said in Luke 11, 9 to 13. So I say to you, ask and it'll be given to you. Seek and you will find. Knock and it'll be open to you. For everyone who asks receives. To him who seeks, he finds. To him who knocks, it will be opened. Now suppose one of you fathers is asked by his son for a fish. He'll not give him a snake instead of a fish, will he? Or if he asks for an egg, he'll not give him a scorpion, will he? 
you know, you look at this and you go, hmm, yeah, 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 that, 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 I, I get it. You know, hey, that's funny. I can hear the people cracking up when he said, Jesus had quite a sense of humor. <laughs> you know, did you ask for, a, you know, a fish, you give him a snake, that's a crack up. Or a scorpion, you know. But listen to what he says. Verse 13 there, if you being evil know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more will your heavenly Father give the Holy Spirit to those who ask him? There it is. You can ask to be filled with the Spirit. And when you've come in that Spirit, however it happens in your heart, it's always a yes. And so, here's the fifth point, and this is important. This is where a lot of people stumble. By faith, receive it. By faith, receive it. 1 John 5, 14 and 15. And this is the confidence we have before him that if we ask anything according to his will, he hears us. And if we know that he hears us in whatever we ask, we know we have the request that we asked from him. It's a given, it's a guarantee. It's anything according to his will. Is it his will for you to be filled with the Holy Spirit? Duh. Command you, be filled with the Spirit, Christian. So you know, on that basis, you can just receive it and thank him. I like, I like what Paul said to the Galatians in chapter three, verse two. He says to them, this only thing I want to find out from you, did you receive the Spirit by the works of the law or by hearing with faith? Point is, you heard and you believed. And boy, there was the Spirit transforming and changing your life and your walk and your direction and, and everything else in your life is dynamically new. You're walking with him now. And it was that they believed. They just, they just believed. I like what old St. Augustine said so long ago, and I'm going to paraphrase it. But it's like this. Don't seek to see proof in order to, order to believe. Believe that you might see. That's the way it works. I remember in my experience. That's how it started with me. First Saturday in March, 1970. I just, Lord, I want you to be in control of this life 100%. I just made that Saturday morning on my knees in our little living room. Joyce and I had been married for one month. She had no idea what she was getting into. And you know what? Listen to me now. When I prayed that prayer with all of my heart, nothing happened. But you know what? It worked. It worked, and it's worked to this day. You know, <clears throat> the uh, filling of the Holy Spirit is the essence of the Christian life. It is your spiritual life in Christ. When Jesus said, I have come that you might have life and have it more abundantly, this is what he's talking about. It's only experienced when you fully surrender your life to Christ. Let him have it. Let him have it all. I love this. I'm going to end with this. <clears throat> A fellow named <clears throat> Chapman, I can't think of his first name right now, but he goes way back. He's probably in my grandparents' generation. But he was seeking to be filled with the Holy Spirit. He was already in the ministry. And here's a part of his testimony. I had been struggling for five years. I had had visions of his power and glimpses of what I might be if I were filled with the Holy Spirit. But all this time, like the disciples at Ephesus, there was a great lacking at last, I reached the place where I felt that I was willing to make a surrender. 
I reached it by the path marked up by one who said, if you're not ready to surrender everything to God, are you ready to say, I am willing to be made willing about everything? That seemed easy. And alone before God, I simply said, I am now willing. Then he made the way easy. He brought before me my ambition, then my personal ease, then my home. Then other things came to me, and I simply said, I will give them up. At last, all my will was surrendered about everything. Then without any emotion, I said, my father, I now claim from thee the infilling of the Holy Spirit. From that moment to this, he has been a living reality. I never knew what it was to love my family before. I questioned whether they ever knew what it was to love me, although we had called ourselves happy in the love of each other. I never knew what it was to study the Bible before, and why should I? For I had, had I not just then found the key, I never knew what it was to preach before. Old things are passed away in my Christian experience. Behold, all things have become new. <laughs> That's the filling of the Holy Spirit. And I'm here to tell you, the Spirit-filled Christian walk by faith is an adventure in Christ. Last week, Pastor Dan gave a beautiful message about loving God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your mind. And if you decided you're going to go out and, okay, watch me. Stand back, God. Watch what I can do. Good luck on that one. Your experience will be crash and burn in short order. But he's given you his spirit. That's what the Holy Spirit is there for. And may, I'm telling you, when you've turned it over to him by faith, it's yours, Lord. Life becomes an adventure in Christ. Where are we going? What are you going to do, Lord? Jeremiah 29, 11 is my, my youngest son's life verse. And that's, Lord speaking, I know the plans I have for you, declares the Lord, my plans for you. Plans for welfare, that's that Hebrew word, shalom. Plans for welfare and not for calamity, to give you a future and a hope. I am here to tell you, it doesn't get better than that. Oh, Christian. I hope you've discovered the joy of walking by the Spirit. And if you haven't, enter in. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, thank you for the time we've had together. And thank you for the wonderful, wonderful gift of our salvation and the gift of the Holy Spirit to make this life real, true, meaningful, powerful. Wow. Thank you, Lord. Let it be. For the glory of Jesus Christ, let it be. And all of God's children said, amen. Amen. There's nothing worth more that could ever come close. No thing can compare. You're our living hope.